Welcome to the Multiverse video series. I'm Javier Luraski, and today we're going to talk about what is deep learning. So the first thing you should know about deep learning is probably AlphaGo. AlphaGo is a, play, a computer program developed by Google that played against uh, the world champion of Go, Lee Sedol. And what is interesting about this um, particular match and from AlphaGo is that is the way that it, in which it played. Most of the commentators describe him as creative, as intuitive, and kind of like human-like play. And this is mostly needed because Go is a very complex problem, so you can't really use the standard, you know, like computer-like things that you would usually do, like searching for the solution. Why not? You need to use a different set of techniques. And the techniques that AlphaGo uses are based in deep learning, which we're going to explain throughout this video. The other great example that you should know about when uh, thinking of deep learning, it's a competition where players of Dota, a real-time uh, real strategy game, get together and they basically play against a set of players and they usually, it's a team of five people, then play five versus five. And, you know, it's real time, it's pretty hard. And, you know, you need to consider a lot of things. You need to use teamwork and why not? And the great thing was that OpenAI built a computer program called OpenAI5. So they replaced the five players with, you know, five automated agents that played for the players and they basically matched their, they, they play against the, the current, uh, you know, champions. And AlphaGo was able to win, uh, I believe, two of the matches. So the, the fact that it performed well is, is just pretty amazing, right? Um, it's, it's one of those problems that is not very well defined. There are so many strategies. It's not, ever, it's not even well understood, like, how you should, like, beat these games. And again, uh, in this case, OpenAI also used deep learning principles to perform quite well in this, in this particular problem. But what exactly is deep learning? Th those are, these are just two, you know, like very interesting, very relevant examples. But what is deep learning exactly? To answer that question, we're going to look at a survey paper. And a survey paper is just literally a a research paper that takes a look at a lot of other papers and try to, you know, like tries to bring you up to speed, right? Um, in this case, the up to speed part that we're going to use is figuring out like what got us to deep learning. There is a table in this survey paper, which I feel is quite useful. Um, the table is titled um, The History of DNNs. Below is, if, is a brief history of neural networks highlighting key events, right? Uh, so these key events are the papers and publications that build the foundations of what deep learning is today. So what I'm going to do in this video to explain what is deep learning is I'm basically going to go through each of them and I'm going to give you a brief overview of the paper with some examples. Um, so yeah, that serves as an introduction and also gives you some pointers if you want to look forward and into, you know, go deeper into each of the topics. So we're going to start in 1943. In 1943, McCulloch and Pitts write a paper where they explained that uh, you uh, kind of like neuron-like circuits can be combined to form a Turing machine. And this is how this is how the paper looks like. A logical calculus of the ideas imminent in nervous activity. Uh, not going to get into too many details, but what is interesting from this paper is that it's inspired in neuroscience. At this point in time, what we were really trying to figure out is how to build computers in general. We didn't even have like, you know, we weren't even sure what a good architecture for a computer was. But in creating, in, in setting up the foundations of, um, you know, deep learning, this paper basically inspired the community to use neurons as building blocks. And neuron, it's a very broad term, right? Like it's not that it's not that we know exactly how neurons work and it's not that we know exactly how the brain works. Um, so a lot of these methods follow inspirations on the brain because we know that it works. 
And we say like, well, if the things is do if the brain is doing things like this, you know, in the case of the brain, we know, you know, the inspiration here is saying the brain is made out of neurons. And, and you know, that sounds silly. It's like, well, we don't know what they do and we don't know how to compute. That's fine. But like the inspiration of saying something very complex that happens in the human brain, it's actually built of small pieces. Now that sounds trivial, right? But, you know, in retrospect, it might not have been that you can build complex behavior out of very small, you know, like non-complex um, gates, right? And basically what this paper does that it tells you is like, oh, you know, like if you put multiple gates together, you can create a Turing machine. And a Turing machine is basically just a machine, a machine that is representing a mathematical model of a computer, which is very helpful to prove what can a computer do without actually building a computer and being exhaustive. So great. Um, neurons are kind of like circuits and circuits um, can be combined to create complex behavior and that complex behavior can basically create a, any type of computer that you're interested in. Okay, that's kind of like obvious now in retrospect, sure, why not? So the next paper uh, is one from Rosenblatt and I think this one is quite interesting. Uh, Rosenblatt was a psychologist and he came up with the conception of what a perceptron is. So his paper is titled The Perceptron, a Probabilistic Model for Information Storage and Organization in the Brain. And it basically walks you to how, in a, in a closer detail, like how do neurons interact with each other? Uh, what happens when you're learning? And what needs, what kind of like, at a very, you know, like chemistry level like what are the interactions that are happening in neurons like for instance one of the things that happens in the brain that we know of is that when um, when one neuron activates like it inhibits the um, surrounding neurons right and that way it kind of like can contain exactly you know like it prevents all the neurons from learning everything at the same time which would be bad right like you don't want to see a new concept and you don't want all the neurons to learn that concept at the same time because then like you would forget about everything so there's kind of like mechanisms in the brain to like um mon uh, you know like kind of like monitor and adjust which network which neurons learned when and again like there's a lot of there's a lot of neuroscience details in this paper but it starts getting to a more concrete definition of what are the things that matter right so for instance here he has an example where um, you have an eye with a retina and that retina is providing some sort of stimuli to this perceptron and the perceptron is classifying that stimuli in some particular way and you know it creates a classification model based on using multiple perceptrons against those particular images. And again, really basic. Uh, there's, um, there's, you know, pointers around the paper on, you know, like how synapses work, inhibition and uh, positive reinforcement learning, you know, like negative reinforcement learning and things like that. Um, it's, it's really a mix of psychology and neuroscience with, with some models in, be in, in between. So one of the really cool things that I think are worth mentioning is that, um, well, actually, before we get to that, let, let, let's give a more concrete definition of what a perceptron is. And this definition is not necessarily attributed to Rosenblatt. As I mentioned, Rosenblatt is a psychologist, so he focused more on the neuroscience piece of the work. Uh, but today, like Rosenblatt is attributed this definition of a perceptron, or close to this one. It basically is a linear combination of inputs, which is denoted by X, and then you have some weights. So basically what you're doing is you're saying, oh, you know, like if I want to learn something, I'm just going to basically take different weights for the patterns that I'm seeing. And then if it crosses a threshold, which is uh, just what we're seeing on the, on the, on the very top, uh, if it crosses a threshold, I'm going to classify that as something. Otherwise, I'm not. So it's, it's pretty, pretty simple. Uh, and Rosenblatt was able to put a, a demo using these principles uh, where he gave a computer very simple images, you know, like a dog, a cat, a mouse, a man, a woman, you know, like, a, you know, a house, whatever. Uh, the images were in very small resolution. 
And, you know, you could see how these would learn some of the patterns, right? Like all, all we're saying is assigning weights. We're kind of like basically just copying the pattern and, you know, kind of like giving it a little bit of generalization. And that, that b basic algorithm can sort of classify what type of pattern something is seeing. And, you know, it sounds pretty limited, but it, it's also opening up a whole different way of, um, you know, creating algorithms, right? Like we're used to in computer science to be very methodical and the inputs need to be very precise and the search space needs to be very organized. Like this opens up type of algorithms that are not necessarily um, trained or, you know, they're not exhaustively programmed, right? Like it opens up the space of giving examples and letting the algorithm recognize them and optimize for them, right? So it's actually interesting because the New York Times back in 1958 interviewed Rosenblatt after seeing this demonstration, right? And was like, well, okay, like this sounds interesting. Like, what are you working on? And the New York Times articles looks, looks like this. Uh, I'll just read a extract for fun. It says, um, the Navy said the perception would be the first non-living me mechanism capable of receiving, recognizing, and identifying its surroundings without any human training or control. The brain is designed to remember images and information it has perceived itself. Ordinarily, computers remember only what is fed into them with punch cards or met uh, magnetic tape. Later, later, perceptrons will be able to recognize people and call out their names and instantly translate speech into one language or writing into another language. It was predicted. So, you know, like a very simple example, but, you know, with a lot of hopes and, uh, you know, dreams, I guess, to have computers actually do more than uh, what we think computers should be doing. Then actually, uh, Rosenblatt went on to do some classified research. And, uh, you know, I think I think the biggest the biggest interesting thing, um, you know, that where he finished his research was that uh, there's there's a few gra charts somewhere in here where he basically hints that, you know, it should be possible to connect multiple perceptrons to build, you know, something meaningful, right? I might not be able to find it, but um, yeah, so, so basically somewhere in here, like he's, um, he, he hints that there should, be, it's probably possible to pull together multiple perceptrons into a single into, you know, into a layer of neurons and do something meaningful with that. But it really, it, we really, he didn't really have the chance to explore this idea fully. He focused mostly on perceptrons and applications on that and, you know, like kind of uh, try to evolve what the human brain would, um, would do without having all the answers to the questions. And um, this is where Minsky comes in. So um, Minsky and Popper wrote a book and People think that Minsky, you know, killed research of neural networks for a really long time. And uh, I've, I've seen this comment in a bunch of places where it says like, oh, Minsky showed the limitations of their perceptron and then no one else wanted to do any research in this area for many years. And this is true, but actually, if you look at the book and, you know, you can just search Amazon, literally just search for perceptron, uh, an introduction to com computational geometry, um, one of the interest, really interesting things is that, well, this book was written by Minsky and Poppert, but it was actually dedicated in the memory of Rosen, uh, Frank Rosenblatt, which is kind of awesome because at the very least, they must have known each other. And my guess is that they were pretty, pretty good friends. And um, Minsky had m m a more formal training in mathemat uh, mathematics. Rosenblatt, um, I don't think he had. And uh, part of the role of Minsky was kind of like uh, creating those, uh, the, defining the perceptron as a mathematical concept that, I, that we just reviewed. But this was not introduced really by Rosenblatt. It was Minsky, the one that said like, hey, this, I like, you know, your ideas are pretty awesome of how the brain works, but let's just put some formal mathematical um, definitions around them such that we can do more interesting things and analyze them and, you know, like have more predictable ways of implementing this in code. Um, 
Um, so yeah, Rosenblatt did that, but it's also interesting that, you know, if, if we go back to this, this equation, right? Oh, if we go back to this equation, um, once you have it in mathematical form, it becomes quite obvious that while it can recognize some patterns, it won't be able to recognize all the patterns. So for instance, if you want to classify something and something else, it, this, uh, uh, this model is going to work. But if you want to classify something or some other thing, but not both at the same time, which is known as an exclus exclusive or, a, a single perceptron cannot classify those types of patterns. And um, Minsky explains this in his book, which is great, but also it opened up kind of like a lot of skepticism on this field, because if a perceptron cannot classify all the potential patterns, then what's the point of doing research in the field? However, um, in his book, he also shows um, um, this particular page where he actually explains that it should be possible to connect multiple perceptrons together to recognize more complex patterns. Um, specifically, what the what the book uh, the, the the book quote goes like this: "It ought to be possible to devise a training algorithm to optimize the weights in this using, say, the magnitude of a reinforcement signal to communicate to the net cost of an error." We have not investigated this, so he basically, you know, like showed that you know the perceptron could be connected to in multiple interesting ways but you know at this time we didn't know how to train them right so it's well here's the model like it looks interesting it should be it should be possible to train them in some way i just don't know how to do it and this is also in the book right so it's not it's not really that he was trying to kill research in this field he just made a lot of the concepts from rosenblatt uh, he described them in mathematical terms and showed some properties and you know like kind of like brought them a little bit down to earth of what could or could not be done. And yeah, this discouraged research in many ways. But I think I think it's a little bit unfair to claim that, you know, Minsky was the one that stopped research in this field. Like he, he wasn't really trying to do that, I think. So what happens next? We need, we know that there is these deep layered perceptron um, networks, but we don't know how to train them. And uh, 1985, Jeff Hinton comes up with a way of revitalizing the field by uh, bringing back propagation as an algorithm to train these networks. The specific paper where back propagation gets introduced is a learning algorithm for Boltzmann machines. And if you look here, um, just jump to the gradient piece. You, um, you're going to see that Jeff Hinton explains basically that in order to train these Volt, uh, Voltzmann machines, which are similar to neural networks, like they're fully connected and they're not necessarily fit forward, you can use gradient descent to optimize them. And um, I think a nice explanation of gradient descent is what you find in Wikipedia. It basically shows, oh, if you want to train gradient descent, um, using gradient descent, what you need is, first of all, you need a mathematical function which we do have. Uh, Minsky and Papert gave us the formula of a perception, just a linear combination of terms with a nonlinear activation function. So you need to plug those things together. That's still a mathematical equation. And then you need to compute the error. What do you want the network to classify and what is actually classifying? That's usually known as a loss or, or the error function. And then you basically uh, apply calculus to find the rate of greatest descent of the function. Now, there is one trick that you also need to do, which is the original formula of the perceptron is nonlinear, right? Like it has zero if it's less, is if it's zero less than zero and one if it's higher than zero. So it means that you can't really differentiate that function. So, uh, but you can apply an easier, easy trick, which is to use a function that looks similar to the step function, which happens to be differentiable, which is usually the sigmoid, or at least it was the sigmoid when you know these papers came 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 out. Uh, you can also use simpler functions, but in general, just the sigmoid gives you a way of differentiating and basically being able to compute the gradient. And then the gradient looks like this. You basically figure out like, oh, where do I need to move in order to minimize this function, which you get by differentiating the function. And then you basically over each iteration, you just move in that direction. And eventually the function would converge, hopefully to a local, sorry, hopefully to a global, um, maximum, but if not, at the very least, to a local, uh, you know, local solution. Sorry, I mean, 
global minimum, not a local minimum. Anyways, so yeah, this is gradient descent. Uh, you basically are applying calculus, making the functions differentiable, and then computing stuff over them to minimize their um, to minimize the error. And once you have that, you're basically training those interconnected layers using uh, gradient descent. And so, what kind of applications does this have? Were well, actually back, uh, you know, back around that time, Carnegie Mellon uh, came up with a paper, an autonomous land vehicle in uh, in a neural network, and they basically applied these concepts to training a neural network that was able to uh, navigate uh, in, you know, in a limited environment with, you know, in a limited set of with a limited set of. Uh, you know, like applicability, right? So uh, they basically, what they use is they use a camera, which, you know, the resolution is pretty bad, is 30 by 32. Uh, so it's almost like, you know, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's very, very limited resolution, uh, which all of that gets connected to a neural network. In this case, it was just two, two layers, it was dense. So you basically have a lot of perceptrons connecting to each other. And then the output of the network is just the directions, you know, like the, it doesn't really matter the order, but like you could you could think of this as the perceptron on the center is just go straight. The perceptron by its side on the left, it basically means you know go a little bit to the left, and all the way to the uh, to the left might be like turn forty five degrees, you know, like the steering wheel, right? So so basically you can classify images based on do I need to go right or left, following these linear, linear small you know. Uh, it's, using a lot of like linear models with non-linearities working together to classify patterns, which in this case was autonomous, autonomous driving in a very, very limited way. So th this is how it looks like, um, you know, that, that particular Alvin project. They just basically put like the whole computer in the car and, you know, like uh, put some of the images and, you know, like then you train it, go over and over and, and basically you know like it just figures out like the steering i think this, this is insightful you have the, you have the raw image you have the road and you know this classifies as go straight right and you know like if you you know keep going on and you see a curve like that curve should be classified as go a little bit to the right and you know like that's kind of like what um kind of like what it does and it works out pretty well right um you can you can do you can do some things but you cannot do a lot so you know what what we thought is like, oh, you can, if you can classify, you know, this, you know, with back pro propagation and you need to do more complex stuff, let's just add more layers, right? Like, you know, if, if you want to also uh, need to f stop with a stop sign or whatever, um, you know, you just add more layers and, you know, like some layers are going to classify the road. Some layers are classified these kind of like stop looking sign, sign, sign thing. And then you can just put them together and it should do interesting stuff. And in theory, it's true, but you need to find the weights. And the problem is, like, when you start adding more layers, something curious happens. And the specific term is um, what we call the vanishing gradient problem. And all that means is that basically you're trying to train a neural network with multiple layers. And when you you, you can get you can it's still differenti differentiable, which is fine. But whenever you start training it, there is not enough signal to actually propagate back those weights so you just you basically get us get stuck by training the top layers but the gradient uh, which is a function that is differentiable so it's very small increments like doesn't really help you train like the the, uh, the base layers right like there's just too much noise and that gradient we call it it vanishes because you can't really see it anymore and you know like what happens in practice is like you just let something training and doesn't learn anything uh, so someone had to overcome this problem, right? The vanishing gradient problem. And the next paper that we highlight is from 2006, and that's when Hinton solves the training problem within and for deep neural networks. So how how is this how is this solved? How did Jeff Hinton figure out a way of tro uh, of training like deep ne networks? This is the paper, a fast learning algorithm for deep belief nets, which again are pretty close to. Uh, neural networks and uh, basically they re the key idea is this you basically start by training levels uh, layers at a time so rather than saying hey i'm gonna give you 
this image and what I expect from you is to tell me whether you're going to steer, steer re right or left to control this autonomous vehicle, what this basically tells you is that you should train one layer at a time. It's like, hey, first train uh, the first layer of the of all these perceptions and try to make it do something smart. Then try and train the second layer and then the third layer. And when you do that, basically the gradient has is um, you know, it has it's more constrained. So the choices that it, it needs to take in order to switch things are smaller and allows you to train something that is deeper. So uh, so here's a specific case in what um, what we call uh, what we call today auto autoencoders. Uh, so here's the idea. So um, suppose that you give it an image to this neural network. It has 2,000 perceptrons. And then you reduce it to 1,000 perceptrons, 500, and then 30 perceptrons. So it's, you're basically, you know, this, this is a very common uh, architecture when you, know, when you need to classify something. You start with something big, and then you compress the perceptrons to the last layer, which gives you the classification. But instead of doing that, what you do is you uh, add back the layers and increment them back from 30 to 500 to 1,000 to 2,000. And then you trained, you run the training from this original image. Your expectation is that the ori original image needs to be produced by this neural network. So it's kind of silly in some way if you think it. You'd give it you're giving the neural network an image and you're expecting the neural network to come up with that same image again. You're expecting it in some way to remember that, that image. So what you can do with um, with, with this process is like you could train, uh, you know, this is not necessarily like a very deep neural network, um, but you train this neural network first, and then you get rid of the top part, for instance, and you use the bottom part of the network and you can reuse it, right? And then once you reuse it, you have something useful that you don't need to train from scratch. You can just basically reuse this component and it happens to be better than starting from scratch if you were to plug these to other things, right? And in some ways, what you're doing here, uh, or what we're doing here, is, is also called as uh, dimensionality reduction. And uh, th this is a nice chart. It's basically what it's doing is doing some sort of unsupervised learning. It's similar to what PCA is doing in other models, or why not? It's basically just taking a space and trying to reduce it, reduce the dimensionality of that particular space into something that is more manageable. And once you have generalized it in that way, you can reuse it. And again, this was. These were like pretty clever, and it's a it, these are techniques that are still used use today. So what happened after that? Well, in 2012, uh, there's another paper, and more important, there was a system built called AlexNet. And uh, this system was built by one of Jeff Hinton's students. And you know, it uses, it uses a lot of the concept of deep neural networks that uh, were introduced by Jeff Hinton but it uses a few other techniques that um, maybe maybe they're referenced somewhere else in the literature, but maybe they were also, um, you know, it was innovative to put them together. So one of the first uh, approaches that is taken on, 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 on this deep neural network is the use of GPUs, uh, graphic processing units, which were usually, usually used for video games, but have the characteristic of being very good at computing lots of things that are very simple to compute, like, linear equations, like, you know, a linear combination, it's pretty easy to compute, but you need to do it several thousands, if not tens of thousands or millions of times when you have very deep networks. So you can use GPUs to uh, speed up that, which the AlexNet paper presented. It also used other things like, I believe, uh, rectified linear units, which means that instead of using the sigmoid that I was mentioning, which is a more complex activation function, uh, you get better performance if you use just a simpler, you know, linear kind of like, um, function and why not. So what is really interesting about this paper is that um, it was it was the first paper that showed that we, we can actually do really interesting things with deep neural networks. Uh, what you see in this chart is basically that around 2010, um, the in the computer vision field that uh, with researchers were where researchers were doing image classification, they had about a 25 percent accuracy rate. So you can see here each year by year, there's, you know, competitions where researchers find ways of doing 
creating programs with better image classification capabilities. And they were kind of stuck at around that 25%. Um, but then the next year in 2012, AlexNet shows that, you know, like the improvement can be much more significant against the state-of-the-art models that a lot of researchers have been training and building for years and years. Um, so you have basically a simpler model that can do much more which makes it super interesting for computer vision. But beyond computer vision, deep learning has been applied in so many other different areas like speech recognition, autonomous driving, um, you know, like image classification, obviously, uh, speech translation, etc. cetera. So um, yeah, so we're not gonna talk a lot about of what, are, what are the things that happened up to today, but hopefully this video gave you a good overview of where deep learning came from, uh, why is it important, it, what got us here, and you know, hopefully this gives you gives you also uh, some excitement to look into more technical videos. Some of some of which we are planning to post in this channel as well, so we can actually teach you how to train, and you know, what are the things that you need to consider, and use this video kind of like an overview of what things to um, to expect next. All right. Well, uh, thank you.